The dangerous faggot, formerly known as Breitbart tech editor Milo Yiannopoulos, just got a book deal in which a mainstream publisher gives him 963,000 shekels, or 250,000 US dollars, in return for him to write a book. It's not a bad deal, really, although by industry standards it's not a particularly spectacular one either. But it's good enough for it annoyed all of the right people. Let's explore. Hello everyone and welcome to the Freedom Alternative. Now, whatever you may think about Milo Yiannopoulos and his endeavors, you must know by now that ignoring him or virtue signaling about him is bad tactics. This holds true regardless of whether you agree with anything he says or not. Or I should say anything you may think he says, because a significant chunk of his detractors don't really know what the guy says. But that's a different story for another day, maybe in a live stream or something. So, the reason I want to cover this is to provide you with an argument that will keep on appearing in the current year. The my human rights excuse. And also to take the opportunity to notice the godlike powers that our progressive friends seem to have acquired. Quite frankly, the article I'm about to read to you is representative to the way fake news will look like for months to come and possibly years to come. So, coming from The Guardian, publishing Milo Yiannopoulos' book is wrong, my magazine is fighting back. And it goes like this, it's a short article, so we'll read it in its entirety, though I'll have to interrupt anyway. Quote, Last week, the literary world gasped when one of the largest publishers in the United States, Simon & Schuster, rewarded America's most infamous internet troll, Milo Yiannopoulos, with a $250,000 book deal. But we probably should have seen it coming. After all, 2016 taught us that ridiculing women, people of color, Muslims, and members of the LGBTQ alphabet soup community can make someone immensely popular. Close quote. Now stop right there. Remember when I, what I told you in uh, the video of five practical ways to deal with leftists that framing is everything? Well, the reason I insist on this is precisely because this is how leftists win hearts and minds. In fact, I should say have been winning, because recently the trick started to fail, but it will still work on certain people. That is basically their main shtick, framing. So in this paragraph we see how framing works in the fake news industry. It includes both outright lies and lies through omission. So for instance, we are not told anywhere in the article that Milo is a fag himself. That's lying through omission. Then we're told that he's America's most infamous internet troll, which is an outright lie. Even if you do accept that Milo is a troll, he's not an internet troll. He trolls universities in their own chambers, not on the internet. He's also, well, not American. He may have a significant chunk of his activity in America these days, but he's not American. In fact, he's explicit about the fact that he takes a European look on things and says about himself that he is some fag from England. Now the question is, uh, the question here is, why lie about this? And there is no good answer about this. Uh, basically, the true purveyors of fake news have been lying so often and so shamelessly that it has become pathological to them. You know, it's just like when Hillary, uh, when Hillary Clinton <laughs> lied that she landed under a rain of bullets in Bosnia. It was a needless lie. It didn't help her at all, so it made no pragmatic sense whatsoever to lie. Yet she did it anyway, because she got so accustomed with lying that it didn't matter anymore. What difference does it make? As she would ask. Anyway, let's read further. Quote, for Simon & Schuster, it can also be immensely profitable. During Yiannopoulos' tenure at Breitbart, where he's told gay people to get back in the closet and women to log off the internet, he has amassed more than 1 million followers on Facebook, Threshold Editions, and Simon and the Simon & Schuster imprint dedicated to innovative ideas of contemporary conservatism has a hit on its hands. 
Batianopoulos is not a conservative intellectual leader with a political agenda. He is a clickbait grifter who has made a name for himself spewing hate speech. As the editor-in-chief of a small literary review, I wanted Simon & Schuster to know that broadcasting his rhetoric would have real-world consequences. So I made a decision that has nothing to do with political ideology and everything to do with human rights and decency. The Chicago Review of Books will not cover a single Simon & Schuster book in 2017. And this is where I wanted to get. So, this guy made a decision in his minuscule literary, literary fiefdom to avoid a huge publisher in its entirety because the huge publisher, and obviously far more successful than him, has decided to publish someone with whom he disagrees politically. First of all, let me make it clear how minuscule this guy is. The Chicago Review of Books have, has 3,500 likes on Facebook, and that's a 7% increase in the last week when they got some mainstream attention. Simon & Schuster, on the other hand, boasts around 123,000 likes on Facebook, with 0.3% increase in the last week. So, in other words, the fake news media is so desperate for supporters of its narrative that it goes to great lengths to put on the front page the positions of a minuscule nobody. I mean, heck, my channel is bigger, and on Facebook I beat his reach with all of my pages except one, which is still quite new and a niche one. The difference is that I don't aspire to be popular. This guy, however, genuinely believes that his position is legitimately popular already. Now, I wouldn't be surprised to hear that he believes his numbers were subjected to a ration hack or something. <laughs> but more important, but more important than his popularity and relevance, or lack thereof, is the sleazy argument that he puts forth. Uh, I made a decision that has nothing to do with political ideology and everything to do with human rights and decency. Well, no. No, 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 you didn't. But this goes back again to the framing argument. An efficient debate tactic is to assume outright that your position is not only correct, but itself beyond debate and held by anyone who is not a subhuman. This works very well with certain topics, but not all, not even by a long shot. Human rights is particularly a topic on which such tactic doesn't work at all, not even with many leftists, actually. Because human rights is, in and of itself, an ideology when it comes to practice. I mean, the dictionary, the definition of human rights is a right which is believed to belong to every person. The Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights at the UN defines human rights as, quote, rights inherent to all human beings, whatever our nationality, place of residence, sex, national or ethnic origin, color, religion, language, or any other status. We are all equally entitled to our human rights without discrimination. These rights are all interrelated, interdependent, and indivisible, close quote. Now, that's all fine and dandy, and surely sounds unideological, but that doesn't mean it is non-ideological, nor does it mean that such thing can exist in practice without certain assumptions derived from an ideology or a worldview, if you want. For instance, is it a human right of gay people to live unafraid of being thrown off a roof by Islamists? Milo Yiannopoulos thinks it is, but Adam Morgan from the Chicago Review of Books doesn't. Is it a human right of mental patients suffering from gender identity disorder to be pandered to by the rest of the society that needs to wholly adapt to their disorder? Milo Yiannopoulos thinks it isn't, but Adam Morgan thinks it is. The point I'm trying to make here with these examples is that human rights is not, and never has been, a non-ideological position. Saying you made a decision not because of politics, but because of human rights, is an outright lie. Making a decision based on more human rights is, in and of itself, a political decision. Now, mind you, that doesn't mean it's something wrong about this. Everyone makes a decision based on politics and one's own political ideology. The problem is that Adam Morgan, and most leftists actually, try really hard to convince you that this is not happening. And this goes beyond the more human rights excuse. In general, leftists have been allowed to get away with using freedom of association to politically discriminate against their political opponents, whilst at the same time denying their opponents freedom of association 
to do the exact same thing. As they say, if not for the double standards, the left would have no standards at all. Back here in the real world, not wanting to bake cakes for gay weddings and not wanting to write articles about the books of a certain publisher fall under the exact same umbrella. Freedom of association used to discriminate against individuals and companies who hold values that you find abhorrent. And that's fine! As far as I'm concerned, at least, this low-life lefty shouldn't be forced to review Milo's book any more than a small uh, bakery shouldn't be forced to ca cater to politically abhorrent events such as gay weddings. To each his own, I say. This is the argument we should be making more often. Freedom of association is not just to the advantage of conservatives, but to the advantage of everyone, including the PC loons such as Adam Morgan. Now, sadly, though, we don't always make this argument. Yes, the left is hypocritical, but pushing for the principle that transcends the hypocrisy is the proper antidote. And for now, we're not exactly doing that, although we have gotten better, judging by the comments. Anyway, let's read some more. Quote, According to thousands of Twitter and Facebook users, our stance is equivalent to censorship, fascism, and book burning. But by choosing not to review Simon & Schuster books for a year, they claim we're con contradicting both the First Amendment and our, mission, our own mission to cover diverse voices. In response, they photoshopped my head onto a Nazi soldier, posted my photo with the caption warning this man was just accused of molesting young children, and expressed their hope that the next wave of Chicago shootings might take out some of our editors. <laughs> but we aren't infringing upon Yanopoulos' or Simon & Schuster's free speech. Yanopoulos has the constitutional right to say whatever he wants. He can call Leslie Jones a black dude who is barely literate. He can call Melissa McCarthy, Kristen Wiig, and Kate McKinnon fat and ugly, well, they are. Anyway, he can call transgender people mentally ill, again, they are, and retarded, well, I doubt Milo called all trannies retarded, but anyway, and mock a transgender student during a speech at her own school. Yeah, but why did he do that? Couldn't possibly be because the man believed he was a woman and got into the women's bathroom, thus disturbing the women there? Well, could, could it maybe possibly be because of that? Uh, of course not. It, it has to be whatever phobia. Uh, anyway, back to the article. Quote, and of course, Simon & Schuster has every right to increase Yanopoulos' platform by publishing his book. However, free speech doesn't protect anyone from repercussions in a free market. The literary community and society at large has the freedom to respond in kind. That's why the UK division of Simon & Schuster has decided not to publish Yanopoulos' book. It's why some professionals, such as author Daniel Henderson and audiobook producer Emmett Plant, are reconsidering their relationships with the publisher. Now, this is actually a very good argument by Adam Morgan. It is absolutely correct that free speech doesn't mean free reign and that the market can and most of the times will react to it. However, Adam Morgan doesn't seem to realize that he's on the wrong side of history with this one. <laughs> See what I did there? This is why I insist that we continuously vote with our wallets. Conservatives always have more purchasing power than liberals. The fact that many corporate entities are leftist is, in part, our fault for not actively voting with our wallets against them. And believe me, it's possible virtually every time. Let's read some more. Quote, some writers, editors, and publicists have pointed out that our decision isn't fair to hundreds of other Simon & Schuster authors who had nothing to do with the publisher's decision to sign Yanopoulos. I agree, it's unfair. Simon & Schuster will publish some wonderful books in 2017 through imprints I admire, such as 37 Inks, Salam Reads, and Touchstone. But I strongly believe the literary community must hold the publisher accountable. Why? Because rhetoric like this, which targets racial, religious, and cultural minorities, invites discrimination. It arguably encourages people such as Omar Martin and Dylan Roof to think of entire groups as people of people as less than human. And in his 2012 book, The Harm in Hate Speech, legal philosopher uh, Jeremy Waldron writes that hate speech sends a clear message to its victims. Don't be fooled into thinking you're welcome here. And here is where he lost. You know... 
There is that famous quote, never interrupt your enemy when he's making a mistake, which is routinely attributed to Napoleon, though no one really knows who said it first. Now, regardless of who said it, it's still true. By going over the top with such ridiculous comparisons, Adam Morgan scores a spectacular own goal for us. Now, we should cheer as he prepares to take aim and shoot, as opposed to warning him that going so over the top is, well, retarded. I mean, even if, <laughs> even if we are to take for granted to, um, extraordin the extraordinary and the never pro proven claim that hate speech, as the far left understands it, somehow causes harm, the examples aren't particularly fortunate. I mean, Omar Mateen was an Islamist, you know, the kind of individual against whom Milo preaches against. And Dylan Roof is a legit white supremacist recently sentenced to death. Again, the kind of people that don't exactly like Milo for obvious reasons. But then again, let Adam Morgan be. He did us more of a service by penning this article with this particular exaggeration. All right, three more paragraphs. Quote, in a statement, Simon and Schuster assured the readers they do not and never have condoned discrimination or hate speech in any form. But how is landing a purveyor of hate speech at $250,000 megaphone not condoning his rhetoric? And as an editor and book critic, how is giving Simon and Schuster free publicity not condoning their decision? After the Chicago Review of Books attracted so much attention for our stance and writers more talented than me asked us to reconsider, I lost sleep. But on Saturday, when the biographer of a lesbian artist criticized Simon & Schuster, Yanopoulos responded, there is only one place for lesbians, that is, porn. I remain convinced that to protect the victims of discrimination from its traumatic and sometimes deadly consequences, the literary community must stand against anyone, author or publisher, who pub peddles hate speech for profit. <laughs> <laughs> this is glorious. <laughs> now, for the record, I do agree with Milo. Anyone who has ever met a lesbian in real life obviously agrees with Milo. I mean, outside porn, lesbians are a really nasty and violent bunch. And there is data to support this. The most violent households and relationships ever in existence are the lesbian ones. Two to three times more violent than the straight ones and four to five times more violent than the homosexual ones, depending on the study you trust and on the sample. <laughs> but on a more serious note, these kinds of articles and attacks are going to become the absolute norm in the current year, and the most lucid response is to laugh at them and then point out the obvious exaggerations. The general public's common sense will do the rest. For instance, in this particular case, one argument that needs to be made is to notice the godlike powers that Adam Morgan seems to be convinced he possesses. I mean, really, the guy wants you to believe that he knows for sure what's in the book and thus can accurately deem it unworthy of being read and in fact so dangerous that it shouldn't even be mentioned. Meanwhile, the book hasn't even been written yet, let alone published. In other words, the author of the book doesn't yet know what's in the book, but this leftist critic knows. So he's either God or he's full of shit. Now, the evidence seems to point towards the latter, but hey, I could be wrong. <laughs> anyway... That's it for now. In the following days, I want to flood the channel with videos so we can recover the lost time in the first uh, third of January, because otherwise we lose steam and we wouldn't want that happening. So with that said, thank you for watching. Thank you for your continuous and generous support. And um, I'll see you around on Freedom Alternative.